This is the Magic Word Podcast.com. Hello, this is Scott Wells for the Magic Word Podcast.com. This week's episode is brought to you by the Magic Capital Close-Up, which will be in Colon, Michigan on March the 18th and 19th. That's just coming up next weekend. So more information is available on the Magic Convention site. If you'll just go and check out the guide here at the Magic Word Podcast, click on that link and it'll tell you about that and many other conventions that are coming up around the world throughout the next year or two. And if your convention is not listed there, please let me know and I'll be glad to put it there. It's a free charge. However, if you'd like to help sponsor the podcast or to have a banner ad, I can give you more information about that if you would like to help promote your convention a little bit more than just having a listing. For more information, you can contact me at scott at themagicwordpodcast.com. Well, there are a lot of things to talk about here this week, and I want to get right to it. First of all, last couple of weeks, we've been running a contest for one of three copies of The Self-Working Trick by John Gaspard, and we will announce the three winners on the backside of this episode. So just hang around and tune in after we're finished here with Pete McCabe, and you can hear more information about that. Also, we've added a new feature to the Magic Word podcast, and that is a thing called Speak Pipe. So this gives you an opportunity to leave a short voice message up to about 90 seconds. If you have a comment or a suggestion or just a shout out that you want to leave or there's something that's been bothering you or something that you like, please let us know. And we might just post your audio on an upcoming episode. So if you'll just go to the magicwordpodcast.com, there will be a banner ad that says Speak Pipe and just click on that and it will take you to another offsite webpage where you can then leave a short message and I'll be notified and I can and get right back to you with my audio reply. So give it a try. It's fun, fast, and easy, and a good way for you to communicate with me. Well, when I attended Magi Fest 2022 in Columbus, Ohio in January, I had several people there that I had an opportunity to sit down and chat with, and this week I'm going to give you the last of those conversations that we had. It was with one of the featured speakers who also conducted a workshop as well as one of the afternoon talks. Pete McCabe is someone I have known for a long number of years. In fact, we talk a little bit about that going back to the days of Bruce Barnett's electronic grimoire, or the EG, as some of you might remember. Pete was part of that as well, and we had communicated back and forth, and so we have been long-distance friends, but we finally had the chance to actually sit down and talk face-to-face in this conversation. He is someone who has written not one but two volumes of a book called Scripting Magic, which is available through Vanishing Inc., and I would highly recommend those if you're looking to improve your act. And there's nothing better than being able to know exactly where you're going. So you have to have a good character and to develop that script based around that character. So he talks a lot about that in his workshop and in his books, and he will recount a few of those tips and tricks in our conversation. Plus, he gives us a lot of his credentials leading up to why he is an expert in this field. So I'm not going to spoil any of it. I know you'll enjoy our conversation we had this week with Pete McCabe here on The Magic Word. Today I'm with someone who you should know, and if you don't have his book or books, you should, and that's called Scripting Magic. One and two? One and two. One and two. two. Uh, Someone from California who is actually a professional teacher and someone who I guess could provide us with a lot of really good advice, not only scripting, but also on directing and producing and everything. And so, Well, I don't know about producing. I have not any experience producing. I have watched some director's work. Okay. Um, Well, from California. So I don't like to (laughs) expand my expertise beyond what it is. But also a member of the Magic Castle. Member of the Magic Castle. There we go. And I I have been a professional writer, and I have worked on television show, and I have... Um, written things for you know performance. Okay, and just um, because you look like Larry David, you haven't I, ever worked. On I that got show, that. So. Exa- I got that exact comment yesterday. <laughs> Let me introduce Pete McCabe. Hey, Hi, Pete. <laughs> it's great to be here at Magi Fest 2022. It is my first yes. time ever here at the Magi Fest. Yep. And so uh, you said what yesterday? Someone did say you look like Larry someone David. made a comment about me, and the exact same thing. You must get the Larry David reference a lot, and I. That's the that was the first time I had ever gotten it. No, that's funny. And this is the second. 
<laughs> Maybe it's because you have on the headphones. It could be also because I have the my hair is getting more and more Larry David like every day. I think, yeah, <laughs> which is not a positive thing <laughs> for me. But I don't care. I'm already married. I'm not trying uh, to impress anybody right. with my hair. <laughs> yeah, what? Who cares? Yeah, yeah I sure that. don't. <laughs> so we are here then also to uh, specifically to talk about your scripting and sure. what that you do. Do you then. have a list of questions? I'm I, very impressed. No, I do not. Okay, good. We don't have uh, anything. I did the workshop yesterday, and when they came in to take pictures. There's, I don't know, said, don't take a picture of me standing in front of everybody, you know, pontificating. Yeah. Take pictures because the workshop was I would talk and say, okay, now you're going to do this exercise. And for a minute, they would write something and they would write a couple of things and then they would share them for a couple of minutes. Take a picture of that. That was what I thought represented a successful workshop is when I say share, everybody immediately turned and started sharing very eagerly what they had just written. And to me, that was the best. That's what I look for. Mm -hmm. If they're doing that, then I know they're doing the exercises and they care about it, at least some. Uh, and it's very easy to talk about scripting and just you don't have any idea whether anybody really is what they're getting out of it. Well, well getting into that, have you been teaching scripting? And uh, this is the first time I've attended a workshop. But I mean, you and I have kind of communicated. I've been well aware of you. I've got your books. Was it the not the Genie Forum, but it was uh, certainly there. But Oh, golly. There was uh, another online magic. Uh, was it Gemini, perhaps? There was the... Um, that Steve, e. Joe Stevens had. Yeah, the electronic grimoire. That yeah. was where I, I first... Oh, right. You and I started, I think. Because remember on the EG, that's whenever you had to call a number and you get that... You know, kind of... Oh, yes. That was that days of the internet <laughs> AOL, where you had exactly. to send a fax in order yes. to connect to the internet. And, uh, yeah, the electronic grimoire. And that was where I got to uh, know you and read some of your posts. That yeah, you had, that was uh, a fascinating written. thing. I still... If Bruce Barnett is listening to this podcast, Bruce, I'd still love to get that. He has a yes. DVD ROM mm -hmm. of the entire Iju uh, digest, uh, yes. the entire history of it, which he's supposedly, when he's just finishing up, and then I can't wait to get it because I'm really looking forward to go back and look if at some of If you do want to hear about that, please let me know then as well because I hope Bruce is listening to this too because there was something they had, uh, someone had posted about, and I don't know if you remember this, Pete, but it was a uh, birthday thing. They could tell you what your birthday was of whatever day and year, and you would tell them what day of the week it was. Oh, yes. I mean, I don't remember that specifically, but I know there are multiple systems of doing that. Uh, yeah, but in this the was Gardner easy. Books, I think, this was some, yeah, in fact, my partner Banachek had in one of the psychological series books we put out had a method in there, but it was a little bit more complicated. But as I recall, the one that was in the EG was very straightforward. It's like, oh, that makes sense. And I did that for the longest time that I completely forgot about it. And I can't find that oh, that's anymore. Great. So there was a trick that I invented with somebody else that I had never met just through the EG. Yeah. That we worked on. I said, you could do this. Oh, and then you could do that. And, you know, we each contributed back and forth. I don't even remember what part of it was mine or his. Yeah. But I can't remember who it was. Do you remember also? There was so I want to guess the first thing I'm going to look for is find out who that is because I have an idea to take that trick and make it a, a further thing. And I want to be able to, you know, check with the person who helped create it and at least credit them. <laughs> there was another mutual friend of ours who is a member of the castle. and His name will come to me in just a minute. But he also posted a lot of stories about Di Vernon. So uh, was that Mike Perovich? That's who it was, Mike oh, Perovich. Mike is great. He is a wonderful guy. Lore he, and magic. He knows a ton about magic, too. Yes. <laughs> and as a result of that, he and I got to be friends. And I gathered all those stories, and I put it into a, uh, a booklet. Yes. And then I sent it to him. I have I, that book. And I said, can I help publish this for you? And he said, well, no, I'm planning on doing this ultimately myself. And it was like, I don't know, 10 years later, he finally did. And I did get a copy of that when I was at the Magic Castle swap meet one day that I picked up. Because they're out of print, and it's a phenomenal book. Book. Yeah, there's two. Him and Howard ha Hamburg Ham are really Hamburg, tremendous. Yeah. Re you know, their, their connection back to Vernon and the guys from that yeah, era Ray is Jennings a priceless. And, thing. Yeah, Charlie Miller and all those guys. Yeah, but the stories that he they were. It was kind of like what I would call a bathroom book because they were just short stories, like a chapter of uh, Vernon uh, telling him, I remember when Ray Blackstone Sr. had these donuts or whatever it was, or I was playing pool with Harry Anderson. Or... Well, talk to Howard if, you want to, if you've ever not had him oh, on the I podcast. I have. Okay, yes. sure. But he, I just, he was telling me about how the Howard pranks and I he were very good friends. They were, they, him and somebody else pranked the hell out of Kreskin. And I can't now, even that begin. Story I don't remember. I can't. If you see Howard ask him that story, but I okay. can't even begin to try to, you know, do justice to the story. <laughs> but it was a fantastic thing to hear. Okay. <laughs> now on scripting, yes. your background in teaching what high school or I college? I teach middle school. Middle school. Um, okay. Seventh and eighth grade English. English. I was going to say journalism. But creative English. writing sometimes. I did teach the journalism elective in our uh -huh. school, which we don't have every year. Mm -hmm. And then scheduling, I don't always have an elective. This year I have no elective. Some years they have schedule works out that I can have an elective. So I don't even, but mostly it's English and occasionally creative writing. And what was your background as far as what college and where did you, what'd you get the degree in? So I went to Yale. I got a degree in psychology. Mm -hmm. I guess I still use it. 
in the classroom, but I never became a psychologist. I, when I graduated, I had no idea what to do. I was actually telling somebody this. Uh, somebody came up to me yesterday. They were like a senior in college and didn't know what to do. And they were asking me for life advice, which is the first time I've ever had that. I've had people come up to me, have magic me advice. advice. But this was effectively life advice, a suggestion. So I said, I told them my experience, which is most of what I can offer in terms of advice. I'll tell you what I've done, and it either worked for me or didn't. But when I graduated, when I went into college, if you'd asked me what I want to do for a living, right. I would have said probably a lawyer, but I don't know. Because mm -hmm. at the time, I seemed to be pretty good with logic, and that seemed like a, you weren't married. You were kind of single. So you oh, could I was totally yeah, yes, whatever, single in any whatever. direction you wanted to go. But then, by the time I graduated college, the only thing I knew was that I didn't want to be a lawyer. Mm -hmm. I hadn't gotten any closer to what I wanted to be yet. <laughs> but so, you know what you didn't want to be, right? I knew what I didn't want to be. So at some point, I sat down and I thought about what had I done at college? What were the classes that I enjoyed the most? Yeah. And the class that I enjoyed the most and did the best in was a computer programming class, Intro to Computer Programming. Mm -hmm. And I would go in and not even pay attention to the lectures. I would just go and explore on my own. And I sure. aced everything and I knew it all. And I would spend hours working after doing the homework for the class. I would spend hours working and just exploring and mm -hmm. learning about it. And so I thought to myself, maybe that's what I should pursue. And so I became a computer programmer. And I did mm -hmm. that for about seven years. And while I was doing that, I noticed anytime you'd have to write something like instructions for how to use the system. I would always do those. I, let me write those instructions because I just found that I enjoyed writing. And I... I that was so back me, when we had a key punch, kind of uh, those uh, those cards you're talking about, those... Uh, no, you know? I'm talking about those. So with the programs I was writing, like I wrote programs at Merrill Lynch that the oh. internal trading desk would use to I'm keep sorry. track of their positions. I understand, yes. Um, it wasn't uh, end user software. No, you never saw any program I wrote. I wrote programs for ABC I know what you're so that about. they could track ratings I be, and things. I used to be a trader. Yeah, yeah. So, and, oh, yeah. okay. So then I worked for the collateralized mortgage obligations. Okay. Uh, the the mortgage-backed securities desk, mm -hmm. that was the thing. The whole money, the sh big short... Yeah, that was, I, I, I had left that, that field just about a year or two before that all happened. Mm -hmm. So I knew that was that was where I was working. And so anytime I had to write anything, I would just ask to get that. Mm -hmm. And so I just kind of liked writing. So at some point, I decided to write a book. So I had this idea that I would eat. I lived in New York City. I would eat pizza every day for the month and write a book where every day there would be an entry. <laughs> okay. And so I thought this seemed like a thing that I could write something about. It wouldn't have to be a big, long thing. I would only be committing to maybe a month. And I would see if I really like writing. Now, this was while you were so employed. Yeah, yeah. I was, so you come was, home at night and do exactly. this, eat, eat pizza and write. Well, so in, in New York City, you can just go to pizza, get pizza anywhere, right, anywhere you are. Right, right. Within a block, there's a pizza place nearby. <laughs> there's I a wouldn't, slice. I yeah. couldn't do it in Simi Valley where I live now. There's only yeah. like three pizza places, the same ones over and over again. <laughs> California pizza, every corner. <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> but the um, – so I wrote this book and I ended up uh, printing it on like – I don't know, I bound it myself on some comb binding thing and got a bunch of Xerox copies and printed up maybe 100 of them, gave them to my friends. Mm -hmm. And I really enjoyed that. I really felt that that, was, that spoke to me in some way. And so two years later, I did another one where it was bowling every day for a month. And this was infinitely more <laughs> complicated because, <laughs> you know, I'd grab a slice of pizza on your way to wherever you're doing. That yeah. was easy. But bowling was the entire activity for the evening for or the sure. day. Yeah. But I wrote that one too. And I really felt... Like that was something I wanted to pursue. Was, was to write. Yeah. So I ended up, uh, at that point, I had met a woman and I left to go be with her. We ended up married, my wife now. Was she in New uh, York also? No, she was in San Diego. So that's why we So we met at a Frisbee tournament in Germany. Oh, that's, mm -hmm. And then I ended up, after we had a correspondence romance and we met each other a few times, I moved to San Diego. So I got a job at an ad agency that specializes in computer products. So I could do the writing, but also mm -hmm. my understanding of computers was helpful, especially at that time, which is 1990. In copywriting? Copywriting for an ad agency. And mostly my marketing. Minor in journal, I majored in journalism, minor in radio and television. Well, there you go. So, Yeah, I worked at a radio station yeah. for a while in San Diego, and I would write ads. I mm -hmm. would try to write, I always try to get, again, I always wanted to get the writing gigs. Yep. Yep, so I wrote a few ads that yeah. appeared on the you know local stuff. Mm -hmm. But the um, I started doing this work, and it was a big bonus because I could most freelance agencies would come in to Hewlett Packard was our biggest client. Mm -hmm. So somebody, the printer division would hire some ad writer would come in and write this ad and all of the tech would be wrong because they didn't understand, understand. the tech. Sure, sure. But yeah. I was a computer programmer. So I would find that I knew the tech better than a lot of the product managers, mm -hmm. the engineers, they were the best than me, than the product managers. So I could take care of all of that for them. So I did, yeah. I did pretty well for that. And so I wrote ads for a long, long, long time. And I started writing movies uh, to try to, you know, make that next As step. a script writer. Script that's, writer. that's a completely different kind of writing. Oh, right? it is completely different. Although if you can write an ad, 
you can usually, there are a lot of skills that carry over. I understand Setting that. up your scene in yes. one line mm -hmm. or one sentence mm -hmm. or one whatever, those are valuable skills. Mm -hmm. But it is a completely different world. Whittling away, sure. you know. One thing is if eliminate, you write ads eliminate. and you go to Hollywood, they're not going to be like, oh, you can write ads. Well, come on in. You have to, <laughs> that's not, yeah. that doesn't overlap. Right, right. So I wrote movies and sent them out and I eventually got a, a TV series episodes and I eventually got a job on Sports Night, the mm -hmm. sitcom which was on for two years, and I was on the writing staff for the second year. So we moved to Los Angeles. Did you go to the writer's room? I mean, you were part oh, of Oh, yeah, that, that was that. the writer's room. It was very, actually, it was interesting because a lot of the writer's rooms, like, for example, shows that were on the air at that time, Will and Grace, there were some people who I remember Will and worked Grace. in Will and Grace. Yeah. Uh, and it was, or Dharma and Greg, I might be thinking of, but there were 14 or 15 people in the writer's room, and that was pretty common for a hmm. network writing room. We had six, hmm. and it was much smaller. And in part because Aaron Sorkin, who was our head writer, he wrote every episode. And somebody would, uh, one of the staff or writers, or there were two guys who wrote together. Did he write it on his own, then bring it in, you guys tweak it? Or was he part of the process? He wrote it on his own, and then he would tweak it. What, well, what did you have to contribute then? Not much, okay. to be quite honest with you. <laughs> we would contribute ideas, and we would contribute, guys would contribute a first draft of a script, and then Aaron would rewrite the entire thing, wow. word for word. Okay. So this, I was, that was my first job ever. I didn't find that disappointing. <laughs> but all the other writers were pretty well established, or at least much more than I was, certainly. Okay. And so for them, that was a that was probably not the best gig, right? Because they were they're used to writing a script, and then everybody works on improving that script, right? This one, they wrote the script, they gave it to Aaron, he rewrote the entire thing from scratch. Okay, yeah. And I do again, I don't, I'm not trying to even criticize Aaron for doing that. That was his working process. process. He's had incredible right. success right. since yeah, then. Of course, he did. Um, but that was very difficult mm -hmm. for everybody else on the writing staff okay. except me. I was like, no problem. <laughs> um, but again, we got canceled, uh, and I tried to get work. I ended up writing a the uh, I wrote an episode of The West Wing. Mm -hmm. That got um, bought and uh, rewritten by Aaron. Uh, two of my lines survived, so I, it's okay. <laughs> um, but uh, and then I got a job on a, a smaller series on the National Geographic Channel, uh, and then that I got fired from that. And then I was not able to make a consistent living, and we had a child. Mm -hmm. So uh, my w at one point I was making, you know, while I was looking for work. I was making ends meet by tutoring students. My wife was a teacher, and she would have students that needed tutoring, so I would tutor. Mm -hmm. And I could tutor math pretty well, so I was like, okay. And I did that, and I was pretty good at that. And I, the more I did that, the more rewarding I realized that was. And so when I was eventually at some point, I was like, I, I can keep trying to sell movies, but I have to have a full-time job. Right, to I support can't just that. spend my full time trying to sell movies unsuccessfully. Mm -hmm. So I got a job as a teacher. I got my credential, and I've become a teacher. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've been doing that for 20 years now. And so, as a writer, you got to get used to rejection. Oh, yeah, for sure. The best thing I advice I could ever get for anybody like that, which is advice that I have received, you'd write something and then send it off, and then all you do is sit by the phone. That's the part you have to stop doing. When you send something out, work on something else. You have to immediately start working on the next thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, the point where someone will call and say, Oh, I read your script, and this, and oh, I completely even forgot about that. That mm -hmm. was, I, to me, that was the best mindset. Mm -hmm. that you could be in for that process, which right. is endless. It is endless rejection. Yeah, for sure. Right. Although I don't know how endless it is. There's when I was working, there were four networks that had sitcoms on the air, hmm. ABC, NBC, CBS, and Fox. Right. Fox, right. And so actually we were watching, we would occasionally watch in the room if we were working on a Sunday, who wants to be a millionaire mm -hmm. and who wants to be a millionaire. That show drove probably a third of the sitcoms off of network television. Because it was so popular? It was very popular, and the writers were not sitcom writers getting Writers Guild minimum, which was good money. Good. Mm -hmm. They were, I don't know what they were, but they were not on the same thing. So their writing staff was a fraction of the budget of the writing staff of a sitcom. Sure. And the show got better ratings than any sitcom. It was the number one show on television and so for other a while networks there. saying, how can we replicate that? Exactly. So they the all, all of these and reality, reality shows, shows. Exactly. Exactly. And they all have writers. I mean, I, I know understand. people who worked on the-, the But not on, the same staff size. Not the same contract. That was the big difference. It wasn't a sitcom. I don't know what the exact, how you know how the technical terms worked, but they weren't getting writers guild minimum for writers on on scripted shows. They were writing. So I had a friend who worked on the uh, Paris Hilton show. Yep. And they would write the entire episode, and then you know Paris Hilton wasn't reciting it like an actor, but they wrote all the scenes and they wrote all the things and they wrote lines for it, and then it would get made. Mm -hmm. And they didn't get writing. There was no written by credit because it was supposed to be just a documentary of her normal life. Right. So there was no written by credit. 
So those people aren't, if you're not getting a credit on the thing, you're not getting paid as much. That's for sure. I understand. So one of my uh, buddies who is a fraternity brother, uh, and he's since retired, but he was uh, writer, producer, and director for the A-Team, Walker, Texas Ranger, and several other shows like that. Yeah, solid shows. And then he was actually- A-Team was huge. uh, Yeah, they were huge. Uh, He's retired, lives in Charleston, South Carolina. His name's Tom Blumquist. So anyhow, uh, he was telling me, and I had him on a podcast one time, and we were talking about the, how some people who were better writers than him, but- they got discouraged because of the rejections they were getting. And he said, just what you said, Pete, you got to, you know, to be a writer, you got to write. And you wake up in the morning, you just got to write. And that's, that's the thing. I think if you want to be a magician and you got to perform, uh, whatever you got to do. That's you know? exactly it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's, I, I try to uh, be aware of this whenever I'm talking to magicians, you are a better magician than I am. Mm-hmm. All of them. Every magician I ever talked to is a better magician than I am. Mm-hmm. I don't perform professionally mm-hmm. as a magician. I was talking to Carl Hine down in the uh, dealer room. I, as a teacher, I am a performer. That's a performing art. It is. So you learn a lot of the skills that make you a good magician right. by being a teacher. Mm-hmm. So I think that gives me a big advantage. I can do a show that, even though I don't perform often enough to have the experience that a real professional magician has, I have a lot of performing experience. So I think I'm, I try to draw on that. Right. In front of a group. Right. And exactly. not afraid of public speaking, which is the number one fear that humans have. When I you was know. a teacher, at one point they gave me an elective of speech and debate, but they... They over the summer they added it to the pro, to the mm-hmm. thing and they said how'd you like to teach all elective schedule creative writing and then we wanted to give you speech and debate I'm, okay fine didn't occur to, I didn't think about it at the moment when we got there in class the first day I said all right so this is speech and debate class raise your hand if the thing you hate the most about school <laughs> is to stand up and talk in front of everybody and almost every single hand in the room went up there you go I said okay that's all this class is uh-huh. and the worst thing is none of those kids had requested it because it wasn't even on the list. Uh-huh. At the end of school for, like, pick your elective for next year. Mm-hmm. So that's what most people, that's where they come from. Yeah. Uh, so if you have just, even if you just get up in front of a, do it every day for 17 years, I don't have any fear of getting up in front of a group. Mm-hmm. I, I ne- probably never really did. Yeah. Um, so that was something that wasn't as hard for me. But there's no way you can be a teacher and not have that. No, I think that's true. And as, as far as standing in front of a group and talking, there are different tips that people give as to what you can pump yourself up behind the curtain or whatever else in order to come out. And, you know, even Johnny Carson had a little bit of uh, trepidation about walking back out to the audience first thing. You know? There's guys who th- somebody who throws up before every show. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But then they come out and you'd never know it. <laughs> Right. Because they're really good. But if you have a script, you have a a hook to hang something and you feel more comfortable because you know where you're going. If you're walking out and and just saying, hey, how you doing? Which is a horrible way of (laughs) opening a show. Uh, A meaningless rhetorical question. Exactly. (laughs) Whenever I hear somebody say that, I'll yell from the audience, I'm doing very good. Thank you for asking. How are you? I mean, if if they're asking a question, are they wanting a response? I don't get that. I don't know. Uh, so anyhow, that's just. But my I will say feed. this because uh, you talked about the guy who wrote screenplays and they didn't yeah. sell. I wrote screenplays and didn't sell. I have, I probably have twenty half finished screenplays on uh-huh. my things. Some of which are, I think, quite good ideas. But I don't, I don't know what to do with them exactly. But I know what to do with one of them because I realized at some point if you had a movie and it doesn't get made, it's not really anything that you have created. You can't send it to hand it to somebody and go, "Hey, read this for fun." Yeah, people no. don't read screenplays for fun. No. <laughs> It's not, they don't even barely, I mean, not saying they don't know how to read, but it's a screenplay, it's its own unique thing. Mm -hmm. It would be trying to read technical writing that you don't, for a subject you don't understand. So I, but I realized if I write a novel and nobody publishes it, I have still written a novel and I can give it to somebody or send them a thing and say, hey, read my novel. Right. So that's what I'm doing now. I'm working on a novel. I took one of my movie ideas and I am trying to make a novel. I've got, I wrote, I did the first two summers ago, I did all the characters. And then um, I, last summer I had to work on something else. I wrote a thing for the uh, Video Chat Magic Project, which I thought was very Video uh, Chat Project? What is that? Uh, so Will Houston, I hope I'm pronouncing his name right. Yeah, Will Houston. Houston, Houston, right, of course. Mm-hmm. And another guy who I had not met. They did a book during Video Chat Magic. Um, well, it wasn't a book. It was an online thing to help magicians tr- tr- make you know, the transition to Zoom-based Zoom, magic. Okay. Uh-huh. And then all of the proceeds went to charity. Okay. So I wrote a chapter, another chapter of Scripting Magic, where I um, made a list of all the questions that I would, you know, want to have if I was going to switch to Zoom. And then I interviewed Paul Draper, where I asked him all those questions. Mm-hmm. And that became a chapter in the book. So that was what I did last summer. Okay. And, uh, and this summer, my, with any luck, I will finish this novel. 
And do you have any plans for, and people I'm sure ask you all the time, of having uh, Scripting 3? Because you know, everything comes in threes, it seems like. But. Yeah, and the end of Scripting Magic 2, I wrote a little bit about how I didn't, I couldn't really see Scripting Magic 3 happening. I mean, maybe it could. I just can't see it. Lots of things happen that I can't see at the moment. Everything's pretty much in those books. But, well, it's, I mean, I have ideas, more ideas for more stuff that I would do. Mm-hmm. I don't know if waiting 10 years and then writing another whole giant book is the way to do it. So that's one of the things I've been trying to think of. What if there was like a scripting magic annual, hmm. it's much smaller, almost like magazine size, yeah. um, where this is like not Here's you have to wait changed. ten years, right? This is or this is just what I've thought of or learned or a new idea or something uh, that could you could use or be inspired by or get something out of uh, without having to wait quite so long. So that's what I'm starting to consider. Something where smaller books come out more frequently. There are some things I don't think need to be rewritten or con- uh, series continue. Specifically, I'm thinking of Restaurant Magic. There have been a few books written on Restaurant Magic. And when you talk about the business of, there's only so much business you can discuss, number one. Number two is, it hasn't changed. As opposed to, let's say, marketing, that changes oh, all Lord, the time that has changed. with social media That's now. That's unrecognizable and, from 20 years ago. Oh, and even from 10 years ago. You but know, a it, restaurant gig is probably pretty much exactly the same as it was much. 20 years ago and then 20 years before that. That's kind of what I'm saying. And unless you're writing a book about tricks to do at a restaurant, that's completely different thing but if you talk about again the business of magic right. and getting a, the, the business at the restaurant there have been a few books that are written and so when people ask me i say well yeah here are some the two books i'd recommend and beyond that that that's for nothing you know you don't need anything else well scripting magic when for scripting magic one at the time it was just scripting magic is basically kind of designed to be an overview of the subject and the when i wrote it i was not at all sure mm-hmm. how anybody would be interested in reading it but I knew that I had a lot of really good magicians that were well-known and well-respected who had contributed to it. Mm-hmm. So that was part of my sort of, um, what's the subtext of the book, was, do you see all these magicians that you love and respect? They all script everything they do. So maybe you should too. You should too. Sure. And that was kind of an interesting overview of that. The second one was more step-by-step. Here's how you, if you want to take the process, the whole process, you start with the, you know, the germ of an idea and then go all the way kind through like it. we were doing in the workshop. Uh, yes, exactly. Okay, we're well, going to talk about that in a few moments. But the the, the process is different. Um, but the the workshop is the introduction to scripting. Okay. The scripting magic two is once you've decided to do it, here's a step by step approach that you can follow. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's more I don't know if in depth is the right word. It's more step by step. I don't. There's no really. There's maybe a couple of steps left that I hadn't that I didn't cover. Okay. Like I this could easily be. I only touched briefly on acting partly because I'm not an actor, Mm -hmm. but I can interview actors and add that element to it, especially actors who do magic. Steve Valentine is a wonderful actor, fantastic magician. Mm -hmm. Um, And and so there are, that might be something that hasn't been explored, mostly because that's not my area of Mm -hmm. expertise. Mm -hmm. But part of my area of expertise, I hope, is talking to other people about what they do and then writing it up in a way that you can understand that it's not one of the things... Uh, uh, Jonathan Levitt did an interview for me, with me on the stage at Magic Live a few years ago. And so we, I wrote some questions. I, and first, I heard this. I was yeah, there. First question was, we didn't use this one, but first question was, why should we listen to you? Mm-hmm. And the answer was, you're not. Mm-hmm. You're listening to Eugene Berger and John Lovick and Max <laughs> Maven and everybody. You've all these lists of people. Yeah. Houdini. Yeah. Everybody. Um, and so Larry Jennings. Larry Jennings had a thoroughly worked out script for his tricks. Mm-hmm. Most people think of Larry Jennings, brilliant card guy and all right. these things. And those are all true. But he, even he, to say even, yeah. he had that too. So, um, so I, to answer to what's coming up left is, I think, I don't know what areas are left that I haven't touched on because I kind of went through, I thought the whole process more or less. Right. So there, all it is left is, here's a few more examples of techniques you could use. Here's a script that illustrates something you can do. Here's a new way you could do something. Um, well, that's true. Now, another thing I would think comes to mind would be to ask go back and ask some of those people who do script to have them write a chapter and that's what we did like with psychological subtlety series you know we had the first one that was by pretty much by banachek and then number two and three was what how do you use these applications what is a routine you have made using this so if you had a third book perhaps it might be you'll talk to matt king or somebody and say well how have you scripted what is the outline you use what is the process and then talk to paul draper whomever else and so each chapter rather than be by you you can have a little bit of introduction for that and then an afterthought like harry lorraine does or whatever to say here's kind of you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, I mean, if the books have interviews with several magicians. Um, but often, like I interviewed Derek Hughes, and it was his 
our interview was focused more on the once you have a script, how do you deliver it? That mm -hmm. was the very end of the book. Mm -hmm. Oh, you have a script, you have to deliver it. That was his um, focus. Um, Teller talked about the method that Penn and Teller use, their, mm -hmm. their creative process, which mm -hmm. I thought was fascinating. They don't write anything down in advance. But as I understand, if I'm remembering it, they're still doing it this way. They would get up on a stage and basically improvise the thing until they had it the way they wanted it. Mm -hmm. Then they would write it down. Mm -hmm. And they're not writing it down partly so that if they want to do the trick again, you know, after a year off, they can right. remember it. Sure. And protection of whatever legal protection right. they might right. get. Right. Um, but that's they don't start by writing it down. They don't they find they think that if they find I think Teller said if you write up and down, you get stuff that w reads well. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the things I was talking about yesterday. That was one of the big eye opening experiences for me working on the sitcom. We would read the script. And then we would go through, there was a table read and all the actors sit around and right. everybody reads the script. And the, I would just make tick marks wherever there was a laugh. Some of the other actors would make fun of the writers for doing that, that we were so obsessed with counting the laughs. <laughs> but it was a sitcom, so that was Last part of it. Minute, it's yeah. part of what we're selling. Although we didn't have that because we weren't really a sitcom. I, don't, I think that's one of the reasons why it only lasted two seasons. Mm. There was no show like it mm -hmm. that ABC could pair it with. If you like this show and these two shows together, watch this for an hour. Yeah, one, Whatever our lead-in was, our yeah. show was completely different from that. Mm. So there must have been droves of people turning it off um, just because it wasn't what they were you know, looking for. Sure. So I would read something and it would read like nothing. And then in the table read, which is not a full performance, it's just the actors around the table, it right. would get a laugh. Right. So I started to develop my understanding of what's going to get a laugh not because it's funny to read. But because it's funny to hear somebody say it, those things are different. Or there's there's obviously some overlap, but those can be different. And then sometimes it's just an expression. What I mm -hmm. talked about in the comedy talk yesterday was um, there's a bit from the honeymooners. They tell you exactly what's going to happen in the scene. Literally, the I, I, I don't know if I can go into the whole story, but Ralph Cramden is and you know this setup. So Ralph and his wife are he's a bus driver, not that uh, not right. well off. His friend has moved to Chicago and is the president of some company. Okay. So he comes back to visit and Ralph's trying to impress him. He pretends to be the president of the bus company, <laughs> invites him out to this expensive restaurant. And they're at the restaurant. The other couple walks off to go. Um, the other couple walks off to dance. And Ralph and his wife are talking. And Ralph's Alice says, why are we at this expensive restaurant? Are you still pretending you're so rich? We can't afford this dinner. Ralph says, no, 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 don't worry. When the bill comes, I'll make a big show of trying to, I'll got that. But he'll say, no, 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 Ralph, I insist. Yeah. He's this guy so rich. Don't worry about a thing. The other couple comes back. Ralph and his wife go to dance. The other couple, the wife says, are you still pretending you're the president of the company? <laughs> okay. You, how Good can we up. afford it at this restaurant? We cannot yeah. afford to eat at this restaurant. The guy says, don't worry. When the raider brings the check, Ralph will say, I'll get it. And I'll just say, thanks. Now, there's almost no more dialogue. Yeah. Ralph and his wife come back. The waiter brings the check. Ralph says, I'll get that. And the guy says, thanks. Yeah. There follows 30 seconds of continuous laughter by the audience. Right. They literally because told they you the happen. exact script. Yes. Word for word. Mm -hmm. And then just his facial expression. Yeah. Was 30 seconds of laughter. I don't know if you read that on the page. I think you might read that very easily and go, what the heck is this even? Right. But once you start to develop that uh, ability to go, oh, this will this will play. Yes. And then your ability to script is uh, unfolds dramatically because it's not just most people focus so much on the words, which is very important. But that was no words. Thirty seconds of laughter without a single word said. That's what I was about to say. Is sometimes the pauses are things that we as magicians overlook. Actors understand, and that has to do like with your your gestures, your mugging, how you would interact with somebody, or your double take of somebody, or, or whatever. That there might be a, something that happened on stage. Exactly, and your funny. character. John Lovick it, talks about yes. um, what was uh, take my wife, please. Oh, the uh, Jack Benny, who was famously uh, stingy. Yes. And then some guy, there's a scene where some guy comes up to me, your money or your life. And there's a pause. And the audience is just laughing yeah. during the pause. Yeah. He's not even said his response yet. Just his character right. got a laugh from that line. Mm -hmm. Then he goes, I'm thinking. Yeah. And that gets a twice as big a laugh. Right. So that was the terrific thing. And that's something that I have not written really about. Mm -hmm. um, a little bit I talked about it in Scripting Magic 2. Tom Burgoon had this bit at the castle. And uh, he would borrow a quarter from somebody and then say sucker and then walk over to the side like he's going to keep it uh, and the stage manager would hold out this little metal bucket and he would toss it in 
Clever. Uh, and then he would laugh. And then he would say to the, yeah, we do this every night. <laughs> How are we doing so far? And the stage manager shook the bucket. You could hear there's about yeah. a bunch of coins in there. Jingling. That was a laugh. Yeah. Every time. I saw it three times. Laugh every time. Yeah. Would you, if you read that, would you think that's funny? Uh, no. If I don't think so. On the page, it would not leave Exactly. Off the page. But something about that was funny. Mm -hmm. And if this is one of the hidden benefits of scripting that I had never really considered until very recently mm -hmm. is that it enables you to do that. If you can write a script and try to, you can't project what's right going to do that based dash. on a script until you start scripting mm -hmm. and seeing what happens. Mm -hmm. So if you write a script and then perform it, you might see laughs that you didn't even think were going to get laughs. Mm -hmm. But the only way to learn how to do that, how to recognize when something is going to play, at least the only way I know, is to write some scripts and notice how they play. And that's one of the benefits of scripting that I don't know how you get that benefit any other way. We're going to take just a momentary break from our conversation with Pete McCabe for a word from our sponsor, Magic Capital Close-Up. Magic Capital Close-Up is happening in Colon, Michigan on March the 18th and 19th of 2022. And I have with me right now the organizers, Mr. Carl Thornton and John Sterlini there in Colon. Hey, guys, how are you? Hi. Hey, Scott. Good to see you, Scott. You do as well. And I'm excited about this. And this is the first year that you have done this. This is uh, kind of replacing, if you will, or uh, the close-up that Abbott's used to do. And it's just going to be a two-day convention. You tell me something briefly about that and who's going to be starring. We have uh, Bob Sheets and Glenn Morphew from Chicago, who and I'm sure both of you are <laughs> very familiar with both of those names. Uh, it's a two-day convention beginning Friday. We'll have an evening show, and we're also including all the meals for both days. It is wow. uh, March 18th and 19th, and uh, we'll have shows, lectures, and just all kinds of fun. This is uh, the first year that you have done this, and as I understand, in previous years, they have had uh, Abbott's at Costello's in which Jerry Costello was involved, but he's not going to be then this year. So all the meals and everything really going to be taking place at the hall next door at the. Yep. We'll be at the Colon American Legion, which is literally 20 steps. So, I mean, maybe 40 steps away from John. So if you'll stop your, park your car one time and do a show, go to the Legion and there'll be tables down there for sessioning or whatever. Uh, come back to the show. Saturday will be the same thing. Show, lecture, legion, show, lecture, legion. And there will also be a flea market. Can you tell me something about that on Saturday? Yes. Actually, we just announced that a couple of days ago. Uh, we will have a flea market Saturday morning from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. And uh, you don't have to be registered for the convention to uh, to attend or uh, get a table. So There you go. And this is going to be limited to how many people? The convention itself will be limited to 75. And uh, we're... We're moving quite along with registration, and uh, I, I'm pretty confident that it will sell out. That's exciting. And it's only $85 for the registration. And again, folks, this is including all of your food and everything. It's going to be just a whole heck of a lot of fun. And you don't really don't get to see this quality of uh, entertainment at a lot of conventions. I haven't seen uh, Bob Sheets at a convention for a while, uh, lecturing and performing. And uh, Glenn Morphew is just awesome. So you guys are going to enjoy him as well. And so for people who want to know more information and to uh, register, they can go where? Where's the website? Our website is magiccapitalcloseup.com. And that's capital with a A L C A P, correct T A L. Got it. That's Very good. Correct. Sounds like a lot of fun. Good luck with this. That's again going to be March eighteenth and nineteenth, twenty twenty two. So go to magiccapitalcloseup.com and sign up today. Thank you, John. Thank you, Carl. All right. Thanks, thank Scott. you, Scott. Good luck. Have a great time. Thank, thank you. you. And now back to our conversation with Pete McCabe. What is a process or outline, Pete, that you would recommend for people who are, who've never scripted? In other words, yes. you buy a trick, it has a script with it, and some people will just use that trick and they'll just clone themselves after whatever. First thing I learned to do a long time ago is learn how to do that. I read the script, get the idea of the pauses and what they were trying to do to emphasize this or that, throw it out, and then write my own. Uh, so I did that and have been doing it forever, but I've been doing it early on. How would you, what what process would you recommend or, again, steps should people go through to start uh, writing their own scripts? Absolutely. So this is the first thing that everybody should do, and this is not our advice new to the original with me, but you should record yourself doing a script and transcribe the recording. You could get the transcription done on the computer even for free, yeah, pretty much. That's true. Um, so there's no excuse, I think, not to have it. You could do it on your phone and get the transcription right there. Mm -hmm. And then 
look at the script and see how many words you can get rid of. That's the first thing that most, that's the easiest, that's kind of the low hanging fruit. If it doesn't add, it detracts. Right, exactly. Um, I think for a lot of people, the biggest, you know, it's an interesting thing. You talked about the script comes with it. A lot of people say they don't like to perform a script because it's too limiting. Hmm. And then when they perform a trick, they perform the exact script from the demo of that trick exactly <laughs> okay. the way it was. They uh-huh. say, I don't like to memorize a script. That's too limiting. And then they do a trick and they do a memorized mm-hmm. script that came written by somebody else. Yeah. So if that's the way you're going to work anyway, yeah, then write one for yourself. Right. But I, the first step is almost always to go through and see what you can cut out. Most magicians can cut half of their scripts without any loss. Right. And then you can either just leave it as a lean script or now you can replace those words with meaningful words Mm -hmm. because it's an interesting thing i've I've noticed the conditions of a magic trick are very very important for the audience understanding that it's a miracle Mm -hmm. but in general they're boring there are very few magic tricks for which the conditions are interesting Mm -hmm. so that's a very difficult most a lot of magic presentations spend a lot of time communicating those conditions and then there's not time left for anything to be interesting really about the trick except that it's impossible under these conditions. Right. Now, that could be a great thing. It could be impossible under these conditions. That could be a trick. Sure. But boy, it's not going to be anything else. <laughs> so I was just thinking about this. There's a, in one of the old books, what was the trilogy? Not uh, Henning Nelms' Fitzky? book. Fitzky, the Fitzky trilogy. He has a list of the appeals you could add mm-hmm. to magic that would be added in, in comedy and sex appeal and right. music and whatever and blah, 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 blah. And so a lot of magicians respond to that by saying, well, what's wrong with just magic? Isn't magic good enough? And I think the answer is no. Hmm. I don't think magic is good enough. It's good enough for me because I'm a magician and I love magic. You could do a trick that's nothing but a trick. Yeah. And I will still find it interesting. But most people are, you're going to find not that many people. Most people who are like that are already in magic in some way. <laughs> that's true. Um, so that, I think, if you think of a juggler, yeah. they almost all use comedy. Mm-hmm. There's almost always comedy in some right. part of the thing. Most people who do Vegas, la- Vegas Lounge Singer is doing a sing show. They're going to have a couple of jokes in the show. There has to be something that allows the audience to release something. Well, that's true, too. But I also mean you there, you, you, you want to strong... reach all your audience. If there's a family comes to see your show and you're yeah. a magician, are they all magic fans? Probably not so much. Mm. Probably there was one person in that family who really drove the yeah. going to the show. But you're performing for the whole family. But even Darren Brown, someone who's got really strong magic and is very serious and everything, he still has these moments of release. Oh. And what he does is like burst out laughter because it has been in there for so long. And yes. You're following, you know, mentally what he's doing. And then when he says something, oh, then you just really go crazy. Yeah, we talked. I gave a 20 minute talk on comedy and magic uh, yesterday in one of the sessions. And I talked in the first one because I missed. I was in your session. No, no, it was the big session, not the oh, okay. thing. That was the big show. Rachel Wax did her thing, and then I went on for whatever. And I don't even know what happened after because I just went up to my room. <laughs> but a, um, I was talking about the release, the comedy that comes after a serious moment. When I saw the play Streamers by David Raid, uh, and it was a college production. They did a good job of it, but it's there's an intense finale, and people die, and it's incredibly intense. And then there's a moment when it's kind of all over. And so as the audience, you're like, okay, that's all the intenseness I'm going to have to deal with. Mm -hmm. Take a sigh of relief. And then there was a little thing. And then somebody, there was a joke in the script. There's a little story. And this is a joke. And when the joke reached, you couldn't believe how loud the laughter was. Mm. And it was just all of the release of that pent up seriousness. And so you can do that often in your magic trick if there's just, a moment of, I think it has to be genuine seriousness. I don't really notice that working with fake seriousness. Right. But if you can genuinely have a serious moment with your audience and build that up and just let it sit there long enough that it becomes the normal, mm-hmm. then when you return to the comedy bit or the back to whatever else it was, the release is twice as big. Right. So that right. was, yeah, that's, that's a huge part of it. So again, going back as far as the process, what would someone start with? Oh, okay. So here's another question, which I get asked all the time, and I finally have a good answer as of like a couple of months ago. Okay. <laughs> so I've been telling everybody this one. But the question is always, where do you start first? Yeah. The trick or the presentation? And I've asked every magician I've ever interviewed, and the answer is always, I don't know, it's different every time. Different every time. And uh, Darwin Ortiz, in one of his presentations earlier, he talked about that. He said, yeah, different every time. He said, what he said was, start with whatever you like. Mm-hmm. What I think is, it doesn't matter where you start, it matters where you finish. 
Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think you really want to have a good trick and a good presentation, and you probably want to have the, pro the right props for it. Right. And if there's custom involved, I don't perform in custom, but if there's custom involved, that should be right too. And you get all those things right, then you do that trick. Mm -hmm. But in my view, if you don't have all of them, you don't. I don't do the tricks that I have a good idea for a presentation. I don't have the right trick. I don't do that. I have a trick, but I don't have the presentation for it. I don't do that trick. Mm -hmm. Mike Close said he doesn't, he says, I don't ever do the cups and balls because I have no idea what I would say yeah. when I'm doing it. Mm -hmm. Tommy Wonder said, I have, if I have a trick, but if I have no presentation for it, back in the drawer. Right. And that's definitely the way I work. The one thing that I would counsel is that a lot of magicians, they have a trick, but they don't have a really good presentation. They still do that trick. <laughs> I generally don't. Again, because I'm not a professional, maybe I can have that luxury. But I would not do a trick unless I have a good idea for a presentation. Um, so, but my goal, it doesn't matter what you start with. Uh, what was Stanislavski used to say? Start with whatever part of the play seems shiny to you. Okay. Just, and use that as your way in. Okay. As long as you have everything you need by the time you're done, that's what matters. So mm -hmm. start with anything. But that doesn't necessarily help the beginning scripter. Right. But if you know what your character is. That's the most important thing. When we did the workshop yesterday, we start with character. And then every activity after that is like, how you would are. you say your first line of this script, given your character? Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's the first thing we do. Three adjectives that describe you. And then write a one-sentence description of your character. And let me say, equally important, what you were doing then, Pete, is to say, okay, you've got three minutes. And I think that that was one of the most important things because if you're going to be at home and you're sitting in front of your computer or even on a notepad or whatever you're writing uh, your script, if you start to think about something on your own, your mind will wander. Whereas if you have a deadline uh, of trying to do this, it's like just throw it on the page. You can kind of work with it later, but you might be amazed about what you can come up with when you're under fire like that and about how that you are really stripping away the things that your mind are thinking, no, that's not it. No, that's well, throw it down there yes. and then look at it. Yeah, I talked about this. One of the big misunderstandings, I think, about the creative process, every now and then an idea will come to you, yeah, and it's a wonderful feeling, but we sort of have this idea that that's how you get ideas. They come to you. And yeah. so the, a lot of people sort of imagine that the creative process is waiting for ideas. Uh -huh. And you might have to, it might take a while to come up with a good idea, but the, time, the time is not spent waiting. <laughs> right. You come up with ideas and you write them down and then you try to come up with a better one and you just write down all the ideas you come up with. Mm -hmm. That's the creative process. There's no waiting. Mm -hmm. You get an idea, you write it down. And sometimes you get an idea, you know it's wrong. At this point, I've been doing it long enough that I don't necessarily write down every idea. Yeah. But if you're beginning, I would say, yeah, write down. When I was beginning, I would write down every idea that I would come up with. Mm -hmm. You could sometimes see the evolution of an idea in your list of things. Mm -hmm. But that, I think, is the most important. Whatever you come up with now, write it down. Mm -hmm. You then try to come up. But then the other hot side is, if it's not good, don't stop there. Keep coming up with more ideas. Right. John Cleese had a fascinating talk about this, in, uh, talk about creativity. He said there was, when you're writing a, a sketch and you are not finished, then there is a pressure in your brain. I'm not finished. I need to be finished. Mm -hmm. So you want to finish. Mm -hmm. And that can be good, propel you to do your work. He says, but somehow you need a line. And so you put in a line. And right. it's not a good line, but you're finished now because you have one. Hmm. And so sometimes he thinks that's how not such good lines will make it into the final product because They're just that, to... I'm done. Yeah. He said that part of success is being willing to be uncomfortable longer because you haven't got something really good yet and to hmm. keep working. Hmm. Even though you have something that's pretty good, that's not enough. I'm not going to stop there. And he even said, he didn't specify, but he said one of the other Pythons, he felt, sort of had that, and that's why their work was not quite as good as it would have been. They were more willing, he thought, to, and I, he didn't mention who it was, uh, not yeah. that I would want to be of gossip, but that they were more willing to settle for just a line that was okay rather than to keep working and find the best I like line. what you were saying then also yesterday about keep pushing yourself. It's like a marathon run or whatever. You go so far and then you keep doing more. And I think that's something that Vernon or someone had said before is magicians stop thinking too soon. Oh, indeed. And I, it's true of both running and thinking. Mm -hmm. Bec and I remember this was a, one of my – one of the realizations of the last five years for me was that basic idea that if you – Go until you're tired and then you stop. You're, the next day, you're not going to be able to go any further. Mm -hmm. The only way to build your endurance is to go as far as you can go and then keep going even when you're tired. Mm -hmm. And then the next day, you'll be able to go farther before you get tired. And so it's I like think stretching that's stretching your intellectual and creative it's muscle. It's exactly the same. Uh, it works exactly the same. You, mm -hmm. If you run that way, you know, if you're trying to, you know, the scripting workshop is an hour. That's an hour. That's right. a long time for a lot of people, especially if they have not 
no, done this kind of me. stuff. I mean, <laughs> I and they're it. and they're it's new to them and they're not yeah. really sure how well it's working and it's not easy to do that for an hour. Oh, man. Well, I don't know if you noticed, twenty four minutes of the hour were either people writing or sharing what they wrote and me just standing there. There's a quiet you say yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's that's but that's tiring. Especially but, if it's new. When to we you. were talking then yes when we were doing that then yesterday, I was the one who had said, Oh, and you said, oh, I love that. Yes. That. Oh, that because, was you. Yes. Oh, I'm so glad. My <laughs> because, man, favorite, it's like, oh, this my hit favorite me. sound as a teacher is to hear some kid go, huh. Yeah. That's the great. Oh, said. I said, huh. yeah. that's such a good feeling for me. Mm -hmm. What was it? Do you remember? I do remember. Uh, it had to do with a, um, uh, how you go about asking for a bill, for a bill and lemon trick, for an opening thing. Just saying, instead of saying, has anyone got 100? You know, of actually coming into that. And it just still requires some work. But I got a genesis of an idea of saying, some people think uh, a million dollars doesn't go as far as it used to. And to some people, a million dollars is only worth 100 bucks. And to some people, $100 is worth a million dollars. I want someone from that former category, <laughs> if someone can please just give me $100. And I'm thinking, I mean, loan me $100. I'm thinking, well, I may not be a millionaire, but I'd like to be treated like one or thought of as one so i'm going to give you a hundred so i'll have someone who will so it, it fits my character does as, somebody want to stand up and pretend to be so rich that they can just casually lend me a hundred bucks precisely that's so, a great so right. psychologically i'm thinking the psychographic not the demographic but they're trying to reach this psychographic of i want to be in that group yes and, and also that's to great. my character as trying to be a business like executive magician who is someone's like well i'll give you a hundred back i mean i've got a hundred myself but let me borrow yours you know i'm that's I mean, great. I, I look so it's not just your character, though. You have yes. now given the audience member a character to play. That is exactly right. And it doesn't have to be their character. I, so I, they can play that without feeling embarrassed and because it's not them. And that, I was like, oh. That is a great thing. So that sounds like a great germ. If you can work that into yeah. a usable thing, that'll be terrific. Mm -hmm. I should say Jim Lewis had a terrific bit about borrowing a bill. He, he, he did his bill switch routine, which is in uh, Scripting Magic. Mm -hmm. I forget which one. That um, the... He would talk about who's ever won the lottery and who's the thing. And so there was a lottery part of the sort of lead in was the intro. And he would get a spectator who raised their hand and he said, Dude, can you lend me a dollar? Mm -hmm. And he was going to, I think he's using it for the, I forget the exact routine he's doing with it because he has two bill switch routines. But he, oh no, it's a, it's a change to the thing. But he would see the ball the dollar. And if they don't have a dollar, mm -hmm. he would say, somebody back, find a backer. Yeah. Some, they would borrow a dollar and then give it to him. Gotcha. So whoever he picked for the show, right. that's the person who's doing the trick. Hmm. And he's good. If they don't have a dollar, no problem. We'll find a dollar for you somewhere. Somebody. And the dollar comes up. Yeah. And that seemed to be, that's a fast, I never thought of that way approach of doing it. Right. But you know, who's got a dollar? Who's got a dollar? Who's got a dollar? No. Jim picks who's going to be his spectator because right. he's a professional. He knows he wants mm -hmm. the best possible reaction. He can tell from the first three tricks who's going to give him the best possible reaction in this trick. You're going to be my spectator. Right. Do you have a dollar? No. Well, give somebody, we'll give you a dollar then so that, because I'm picking you. You. Yeah, you're going to be and the person. You're going to be, you're going to be responsible for that person's dollar. Yeah, exactly. Then, and it's, well. it's just using a dollar so people are more willing to do it. Sure, sure. But, well, uh, I, so I was sitting next to another gentleman and I was, as you were saying, yeah, we yeah. were sharing back and forth with what we're doing. And he said, well, the way that I would do that is I ask people, just everyone, open your wallets, open your purses and uh, reach inside and pull out a hundred dollar bill. Everybody pull out a hundred. Now I know that some of you got that little secret compartment over there. Or everybody's got a little money that they stash aside. Everybody reach out and pull that out. And so, uh, so he has people who have done that. So then he could say, "You, ma'am, sir, please come up here." And that sounds hard. great. So you've already got because once you go down that road of people saying no, everyone else is going to say no. Right. So well, so can he make the whatever the bill does? He takes their bill. And then he changes it into a hundred and or whatever, and then to something else, and then their bill is in his wallet in that special secret compartment that he mentioned. That would yeah. be a nice little yep. finish if you could yep. get a wallet that would load in that way. Well, there is something kind of like that. I think that Joshua J has as a routine that's called back in time or something with a bill that's folded and then reach back inside because you're borrowing. I think someone's wallet or and, and you pull a bill out and, or you, and you, as you're pulling one out i think you're loading one or anyhow he's got a, a, a clever routine yeah. so any other kinds of ideas and things again with a workshop like that i think by having a time deadline if you just set something on your phone your ipad or your computer or something where that you know after when it dings in a few minutes okay then look at that and then go back maybe make that a little bit longer time i again like that idea but aside from that what other kinds of things and, and processes i guess just kind of Pick a trick and work on that. Don't try to work on your whole act at one time. Oh, absolutely. Kind of yeah. John, magicians frequently, like, I, I need a new act. Like eating an elephant, and then, just one bite at a time. Yeah, right? I was, John Lubbock, I again, it was ta I talked about this. A lot of magicians will say, I need a new act. 
And then he's like, really? You're going to replace your entire act at once? That's that's not... I mean, again, I'm not a professional, but from what I know of professional magicians, I'm not sure that's necessarily an entirely professional approach to mm -hmm. do it, to bring an entirely new untested act to your corporate gig. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot more, more magicians replace one trick at a time. Right. But I would say pick a trick that you already do. I, honestly, what I would say is pick the trick you have done the most in your life. That's why I started it that way. The, because I find... It, it's easiest to learn a new presentation for a trick that you don't have to also learn the trick. Right. So, and even a self-working trick, there's tricks that work themselves, but you still have to have your handling and everything that you do in your brain. Okay. Right. It, you can't just hand somebody a self-working trick and have them present it because even if it's, you, uh, where do, I'm going to pick this up. Where do I put this down on the table? Where do I put this other piece? Where do I lay? This goes back in my pocket. This right. goes here. I hand this to this spectator. This other spectator has got to be on my left so that when I reach, you know, there's all those little details. Even for a self-working trick, the details of the handling are still, there's many of them and That's you true. want to have them totally internalized. There's nuances. You do not want to be thinking about them and the presentation at the same time. Mm -hmm. So that's why I suggest pick the trick you have done the most often or that is the most fun for you to do, which is often the same. Mm -hmm. uh, and then try to come up with a presentation for it. The a first line, a good first line is, in my opinion, the best return on investment for the time spent to come up with a good first line. Right. And you can study how to write first lines because journalists have written entire books on the subject. Mm -hmm. One of the things you can do I was talking with Ken Weber down in the thing who is, you know, on right. sort of when we were doing our workshops, we were both going at the same time. So I didn't get to see him. He didn't get to see me. And we right. never we just met today. But I was like, there must have been a whole bunch of people at my who left my thing and right across the hall to his we did. and left his we and did. came right across the hall to mine. Yes. So that was great. Well, he produces and directs a, a lot of people in their shows and kind of helps them a little bit with their scripting. But also he'll stop and say, wait a minute, I see this kind of move this or that. We were talking about, you know, I've written. As far as I can tell, this is really the only two books on scripting magic that exist. Mm -hmm. And other people have written chapters and whatever, talked about scripting and whatnot. But it's not, I mean, I'm glad that they exist, but I don't think that's necessarily a good thing for magic that I'm the only person who's ever done that. Mm -hmm. I think there should be a dozen books on how to script magic. And uh, there should be at, at least as many as there are on, you know, how to... I don't know, control cards maybe well, or something, maybe not that. But writers who understand magic that can kind of transcend the two or meld them the way you have. Well, I mean, it's it's true that it's uh, maybe my because I do have skills as a as an explainer of things mm -hmm. as a teacher, and I used to was a technical writer for a while. So that's those are all. Um, not every scriptwriter is a is a good teacher. And what I've heard before is when you go to a party, let's say in Hollywood, and you have somebody who is a well-known comedian or a funny guy in the movies or whatever, and you've got the, also the script writers over there, you know, of, of which one actually is having more fun, you know. It's, you know it's, <laughs> Every now and then, one of the funny guys will walk over to the script writer and they'll whisper a line to him, and yeah. then the guy will go back and say it and get a big laugh. Yeah. And the <laughs> but that is how script writing works in some TV shows. There would be a table, there would be a read, performance and then somebody would have a note they'd call the actors over and a writer would give them a new line they'd go back and try that scene and you know right uh, and stuff like taxi apparently was famous for that there would be oh cast to the rail and the cast would practically run to the rail because they knew they were going to get some new gag that Something was going to be even better than, yeah. than what they were doing yeah. and they were so eager to well, do that back to Larry but, David. but hold on well, the thing i remembered what i was talking about with ken i have again i'm in the world of acting i would not no one would ever read a book on scripting that i wrote in the stage for stage okay there are stage and the movies and television have books about lots of things that magicians do, costume and makeup and scripting and advertising and marketing, choreography, yeah. stage movement, yeah. all of those things. And they're all at a much higher level than the magic equivalent books right. of that. As Darwin was talking about this, magicians want to learn about, you know, something. <laughs> There's a book about makeup for magicians now. And, but if you want to learn about makeup, Mm -hmm. There's one book about makeup from magicians. There's probably a thousand books about makeup from people who were in the theater, in the theater, or in movies, or on television, mm -hmm. or whatever, or both, or multiple ones. And there's so much more information about how to do these things outside of the world of magic. Right. So I've read a lot. I mean, again, when I was trying to be a screenwriter, but I've read books about screenwriting. But there's definitely books about screenwriting that magicians can use mm -hmm. to learn about how to script. It doesn't right. written by magicians, but who cares? Right. The, the basic principles are exactly of the presentation are the same. Mm -hmm. So that is another piece of my advice is don't just look in the world of magic for all of these things that are considered in the magic world. Script writing is considered a fringe mm -hmm. it on is. the fringe, right? Mm -hmm. Card tricks are the middle. 
<laughs> coin tricks or maybe the and mentalism tr uh, this and then there's and then all the way off in the end is theory stagecraft mm -hmm. listen when i wrote scripting magic i brought it down to the library donated a copy to the library yeah and they put it in the patter section okay now that very one of the very first paragraphs in the intro to scripting magic is the p word and i said one of my Eliminate goals that. is to get musicians to stop using the word patter right. it's a script the audience thinks of it as your script right they do they shouldn't respect it more than you do <laughs> And so Patter, it means babble. Yeah, basically. it means, yeah, meaningless, incoherent chatter. Does right. that sound like a good, no. what you want your audience to think of your patter? So I give it to Billy. I'm like, yeah, we put it in the patter section. I'm like, uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> it's really good when the library at the uh, librarian at the castle. And so I was like, okay, okay, sure. And then if anybody ever came into the library while I was there and they'd say, oh, do you have that book, Scripting Magic? Billy would say loud enough for me to hear in the back corner. Yeah, it's in the patter section. <laughs> But it is no longer in the patter section. Mm -hmm. There is now a stagecraft okay. theory slash section, which has my book and Ken's book and lots of other books on the right. subject. But it's still the smallest section of books in the library. There are probably more books in the silk magic section than there are in the stagecraft That's theory. Same. I, I haven't Said. counted the numbers on that one. Yeah. But I think that is where that's where magic has the most room right. to, to grow, grow mm -hmm. as a field. Well, as we start to wrap up over here, let me ask about the scripting magic. How many copies of uh, reprints have they had of the book so far? Oh, good Lord. So the original one was, I think they sold 3,000. We did print 1,000 of them and then reprinted another 1,000 and reprinted another 1,000. That was the volume one. Vanishing Ink, when they redid volume one and re uh, it laid it out and all made all it look a million times better, because uh, I, I did the layout of the original. I had a designer who gave me some templates, but I did all the production work on the first one. So yeah. it was not... I mean, it was done just to be usable quality, but it didn't look good or great. It was just a it's a textbook. Job. Who cares? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it was just to be, you know, it was utilitarian. Now I think it utilitarian and it looks great because Andy did a beautiful job. Since they did it, I don't know. They didn't print equal numbers of the two books. Okay. And so they've reprinted once, I think, but I'm not certain that they will even tell me when they reprint more, because why would I even need to know? They right. probably would just because they're great guys. Yeah. But you um, turned over the the rights to them, basically. So well, they... no, actually, we share it. Okay. But uh, they do all the selling, and I just you know cash checks. Yeah, pretty much. Okay. Uh, yeah, not even cash <laughs> checks, man. PayPal. Yeah. <laughs> so it's um it's that's been the best thing for me is not having to like I've had a website where I would sell. I have a the PM my card bark ebook mm -hmm. and i have a web test a, um basically a version of the like a book test but it's a print out of a web page so you can print it out yourself and carry it around and i would sell those two items on it but i'm shuttering that because it's just not it's not it's if you need time. to get my card book vanishing ink sells it it's yeah. so much easier get it's it from point them. to them yeah yeah because yeah. if you send me an email you gotta wait for me to get the email and then i'll send it back to you You can go to right. vanishing ink and start reading it in a minute or two right so. now right and my close even sells it he did a he added a chapter on using a Mark deck while you're jazzing with a memorized deck. Mm -hmm. Using some, so he there's a copy of the book that is with his extra chapter in it that he sells on his website. So I'd send people to that. Yeah, but I have to get back to your original question. I would guess there might be five thousand copies of five thousand the first one yeah. by mm -hmm. the time because there were three thousand originally. Right, and I think there's probably we're in the fifteen hundred to two thousand twenty five hundred range for the second one. Okay. There's still two in the in the dealer's room right now. As I was well, there you go. So. so for people who are looking <laughs> for that, it, if it you're, you're listening, I don't know. This won't be aired during the convention, but <laughs> no. But I mean, when it does come but, out, yeah. there will be people who are yeah. If you want it, to vanishing in Canada, they do that. a great job. And then, as we wrap up, the reason my I, I call my podcast the Magic Word because I'm always curious what it is. It's a philosophy of my guests. So, what is your magic word or words? I don't mean like abracadabra. I mean like what is it that moves you that when you wake up in the morning what is it drives you it could have something to do with what we talk about it could be a, fam a family thing or it doesn't have to be necessarily with magic but what's important in your life family is the most important thing in my life okay there we go i have a wife, beautiful wife two kids they're yeah. both in college now uh, everything is for them yeah and so the, in, in the in the magic world what drives me is i want to try to be useful and I think that's a that's a huge like thing that. for me in general, especially as a teacher. Be useful. If that's what if you find the books useful, then that's great. If you read the book and didn't do any of it, okay, I'm sorry that it wasn't that you didn't find it useful. You, I if, wish yeah. you had found it useful. But that's that's all I'm trying to be. Mm -hmm. If the book, if you can use the book to do what you want to do, right? Then I consider that uh, I have then I'm satisfied. 
you've accomplished something. I've accomplished something, and I feel good about myself. <laughs> in, in the world and uh, the universe. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that, Pete. Scott, it's great. We've talked about doing this a long time ago, and I'm really pleased that we finally we were able to do it. Actually able to uh, sit down. I'm so glad that we actually had done this. And I said, even going back, I don't know when the EG was. That must have been in the 80s. I oh, think, goodness, yeah. Uh, maybe early 90s, probably the, the late 80s, but uh, goodness. Anyhow, so good to uh, actually get a chance to chat with you. Please, uh, uh, I was going to say give some applause, too. <laughs> so I'm, yeah. I'm used to Hold on, we'll do that. Yeah, sure. <laughs> you need to have the soundtrack. Where are your sound right. effects? That's what I should do. <laughs> so for the Magic Word Podcast, that was Pete McCabe. This is Scotty Al. Thank you very much, Pete, for joining us this week and for all of your thoughts and suggestions and comments. It was great catching up with you and, and listening to all that you had to share. And I would also suggest for others who are listening to this podcast, for more information, you should look into purchasing his books. That is, again, Scripting Magic. And you can get those through Vanishing Inc. or your favorite magic dealer, I'm sure. But I think Vanishing Inc. is really the, the main supplier there. Well, listen, as we said on the front end, we were going to announce the winners of the uh, contest for the copies of the three virtual ebooks, if you will, The Self Working Trick by John Gaspar, which is actually a collection of 12 different stories, uh, many of which have not yet ever been published until now. So, you lucky guys and gals uh, who had entered the contest, I want to thank each and every one of you for doing that. I have tried to run this for a couple of weeks to give ample opportunity and also through various social outlets to let everyone know about the contest so everyone would have an opportunity to win, or at least a chance to enter to win. And so the winners uh, this week of the contest are Steve Aldridge, Eric Hogue, and Kent Dickison. Congratulations, guys. Thank you very much for entering the contest, and thank you also, John Gaspard, for offering these fabulous prizes for these lucky winners. Not everyone can be a winner, but I think everyone who listens to this podcast is a winner. So thank you guys very much for entering the contest, and thank everyone else for listening every week. If you'd also like to leave a comment, as I mentioned on the front end of this, you could do that. Just go to Speakpipe dot com slash the magic word podcast and i believe perhaps uh, that has to be a capital t and capital m for magic and w for word and p for podcast in the after the slash in order to access that or you just go to the magic word podcast dot com and there is a banner where you can click on that and you can again leave a message and i would suggest if you would just uh, subscribe to our pod letter we have over a thousand people who are subscribing to this but that's far less than the 10,000 or so listeners who have subscribed to this podcast and who listen week after week. And I want to thank each and every one of you. And if you have not yet subscribed, why not? It's a free and easy pod letter. That's really just a newsletter. I made up the term pod letter, but it's a newsletter that lets you know about who is on from week to week, who's coming up next week, suggestion from the archives, and also reminds you about any contest that we have running and that kind of a thing. So any kind of special things you are given first notice by being a subscriber to the pod letter. Well, as I said, we had a lot of stuff here to talk about here this week, and I thank you for coming back from week to week and listening to this. And if you enjoy this podcast, please be sure to share this on all of your social media. Let other people know about the Magic Word Podcast. Uh, it's always amazing from week after week. Some people in the magic world still have not yet heard about this. This has been a number one magic podcast for a long time running with uh, almost 11 years and over 650 episodes. So uh, it's been going and will continue to go thanks to your support. And just a reminder... Not to forget that if you're looking for something fun to do and you are a close-up magician, go check out Magic Capital Close-Up that's going to be happening on March the 18th and 19th in Colon, Michigan. More information on the Magic Convention Guide here on the themagicwordpodcast.com. So, until next week, stay well, get booked, and try to be useful. This is Scotty out. Scotty out.